Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Remote Electric Power Management. I'm your moderator, Mike Dimmick from Caterpillar. Today, we're joined by Terry Lewis, Digital Director for Power Generation at Caterpillar, a group responsible for deploying Internet of Things and artificial intelligence into Caterpillar's power generation businesses. Terry's worked at Caterpillar for many years after graduating from Kansas State University with a degree in electrical engineering. Being at one company has not held her back. In fact, she has changed careers eight times without ever leaving Caterpillar. Terry held positions with increasing levels of responsibility in after-sales support, marketing, and product development at Caterpillar, including 10-plus years in Europe. In 2005, Terry moved into commercial systems business development, followed by a three-year stint as service lifecycle manager for electronic and electrical parts. In 2012, Terry became Digital and Technology Director, leading the development and execution of the technology-enabled solution strategy for Caterpillar's energy and transportation industry. And since September of 2018, Terry has been Digital Director for Power Generation, leading the deployment of IoT and AI into power generation businesses, enabling smart connected products in creating value in energy markets. Now, before we begin today's presentation with Terry, we want to know a little bit more about you. We'd appreciate your participation in our first poll question, and we're going to have a few of these spread out through today's webinar. So let's get to our first poll question, and it's simple enough. What's your job role? Engineering consultant, contractor, facility owner or operator, student, academic, or other? We'll give you a couple of seconds to go down. What is your job role? And then we'll see if we can kind of canvas those and find out a little bit more about you today. All right, and as we look at our poll results, three-quarters of you are engineering consultants. We also have a couple facility owners and operators, and 20% of you who describe yourself as others. Now, as uh, I'm going to review before we get going some of the details of today's session, Caterpillar Electric Power is looking to provide informative webinars on relevant electric power topics, while also offering continuing education units, or CEUs, or PDHs, Professional Development Hours. Since 2016, Caterpillar Electric Power has been offering webinars like this on a quarterly basis. For today's meeting, we've muted all phone lines. We do, however, still encourage questions, and those can be submitted by clicking on the Q&A box to the left of the slide. Now, the meeting is being recorded and will be posted to the landing page. Feel free to review it at your convenience. We will address as many questions as time permits at the end of the presentation. And if we don't get back to your question, we'll come back to you personally as soon as possible. In addition, we plan to post general questions and responses to the landing page. If you are a U.S.-based engineer and have requested continuing education units, the CEUs, or PDHs, Professional Development Hours, we are required to ensure you stay with us for the duration of today's webinar. Those CEUs themselves will be issued by Bradley University. They're intended to help those individuals with a professional engineer's license meet their annual learning requirement. You will need to check with your state licensing board to ensure the CEUs are applicable. So we're delighted to have a good mix of professionals joining us today, and now I'd like to introduce our featured presenter, Terry Lewis. Terry? Thank you, Mike. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, Welcome to the webinar, wherever you happen to be. Um, we're going to go through a little bit on the agenda and try to focus this on topics that uh, we hear often from industry um, and, and provide some, hopefully some valuable learning for you. First off is we're going to talk about what is remote monitoring, uh, why, why connect an asset, um, especially uh, standby when they, when they don't run very often. It's a, it's a, that's a very common question we get. The second one um, topic is get into what's the difference between remote monitoring versus uh, SCADA systems. Um, we get often the question is if, if I've got a SCADA system, why would I 
uh, want to do, you know, do anything else in terms of remote monitoring. And then uh, we're going to go into data privacy and security, which uh, give you some, some advice or, or thoughts around what you should ask for if you're engaging or looking at um, a remote monitoring service. And then we're going to end a little bit of fun with where do we see the distributed energy market of the future going uh, with respect to some of the new technologies uh, as it relates to remote monitoring. So we'll dig in, uh, starting off into the remote monitoring. Why should uh, I connect and especially for standby? I guess starting, go ahead, Mike. We're going to get some feedback on that. Yeah, Terry, let's do a poll question first. Our next question is, what experience do you have with remote monitoring? Specifying, purchasing, facility management, or maintenance of remote monitoring assets, or no experience with remote monitoring. So if you can take just a second there to go ahead and list what your experience is, we'll take a look. What experience do you have with remote monitoring? And we have just about half of you with specifying and 14% with uh, facility management, 34% have no experience at all with remote monitoring. All right, Terry. All right, great. Thank you for that, everyone. It helps provide some context. Um, so first off, as we start talking about uh, distributed uh, generation or distributed power, uh, just to get everybody on the same page of what we what we talk about, this is a definition. Um, distributed generation systems are comprised of uh, multiple devices that generate or store energy, so that can be anything from a, a fossil fueled gas or diesel genset or a gas turbine. Um, and then um, we've got energy storage, uh, photovoltaics, um, also you see wind, and then uh, connecting to or not connecting to the grid. We can send not only uh, power, but also in several applications. Uh, the ability to recover the heat and send that and, and use it. Uh, as I said before, we either connect to the grid or, or don't. Uh, the key component in terms of distributed generation systems is the ability to be decentralized, modular, and flexible to the energy demands. Um, there's the value to the, the customers and this, this flexibility, sort of a kind of a, a Lego building blocks of, of energy, is to look at ways to reduce fuel consumption. Um, improve the power quality, um, reduce some of the, the peak power demands, um, especially in terms of optimizing uh, the source of energy and, and cost, lowering the exhaust emissions and noise, and then overall just uh, look, encompassing these uh, site and applications is total cost of ownership. Where we see those um, prevalent is in uh, communities, um, small cities, uh, universities, or military bases um, that put in place their uh, their own uh, distributed energy system to, to help manage and go back to some of those value add uh, opportunities over there on the left. We see industrials, heavy in industries, um, especially in production facilities that don't have good sources of supply from, from the grid and or want to manage some of the, uh, the power and the cost of their power. Um, we see a lot of applications in, in data centers in providing backup power, reassurance of source of power. Commercial, um, everything from the small laundromat um, to uh, the, the big box. And in the United States, we've got folks like Home Depot and, and supermarkets. Um, to off-grid, so these are the applications that are, that are not connected to the grid. A lot of customers that are in remote mine sites or oil and gas exploration or production, some of the offshore drill platforms. And the last one is utilities or industrial in, uh, integrated power producers and, and small utilities will look at supplementing uh, the power demands off of their, their highly uh, leveraged capital assets. So that's what we're talking about, gener distributed generation systems. Um, the value of remote monitoring those systems, um, either the generator or the other equipment that, that I talked about, is the ability to, to view the status and location of, of, the, of the source of the, the power, um, receive updates 
on the engine electrical parameters. Um, often the, the request in power generation, which is, is unique, is the need for real-time alerts. Um, any sort of latency, depending on the application, uh, can be problematic. Um, you can see the current generator faults or other equipment faults and alerts to um, know if there's going to be a shutdown incident or something that would prevent uh, a generator from starting. You can review the performance and the maintenance history, um, compare um, the maintenance and, and outcome of the performance, make sure that the maintenance that was implemented uh, resolved and didn't introduce any new problems. And you can set up custom email and text alerts and notifications uh, around some of the critical parameters at, at the site. When we look at those, uh, technically, those those the capabilities of remote monitoring have a different value uh, depending on the segment, and we've changed a little bit the segmentation here to about segmenting around the type of power needed. So the first one is in the standby uh, power application, and this is one where people conceptually have a hard time understanding why would I connect the standby genset when it's really not running. And the reason that we see in a tremendous amount of uh, increase in remote monitoring is actually the assurance that the genset is going to start when you need it. So it's an added um, risk management for the genset. You can monitor any of the faults and alarms, uh, the fuel level, uh, battery, uh, voltage, ability to start, and, and know and be reassured that when you need the power, it's going to happen. Um, <clears throat> The other thing that they look for in that segment is is cost per kilowatt standby gen set, looking to to lowest the cost of operation, um, but not too low that you don't, you don't have power when you need it. Um, the users can manage the risks with the remote monitoring that might prevent the operation and then stay on target or their budget. When we get to critical standby, a lot of the same needs are are prevalent here with this user group. Um, they want to make sure that the power uh, comes up. Critical standby we're looking at here it might be hospitals, um, nursing homes, and some of those business operations where the loss of power would be devastating. Some of the data centers, um, this is a critical element for them. Same kind of use case in terms of cost per kilowatt and assurance to start, but here we get into um, either industry or business-related um, regulatory uh, issues in terms of compliance. And so here's where um, some of the industries like hospitals will have um, some set standards and best practices for compliance to document that the gen set for standby has been exercised and can perform a certain level of uh, uh, capability under load, as well as documenting that all of the maintenance that's uh, been prescribed has been followed and implemented. So um, that's another big benefit of the, the remote monitoring. So we can capture the data electronically, archive it, and provide that for reporting. Um, the other users can receive the immediate alerts about the fault and they take the corrective action. We also see for both standby and critical standby, um, the request to remote start stop the gen set. So, in the case of some of the commercial applications, if there's an appending storm, as an example, um, or there's issue with a, you know, a power, anything that's going to disrupt power, you can remote start stop the gen set ahead of time and understand if there's any faults or alarms that would prevent the gen set from operating when you really need it. When we get down to prime or continuous applications, that's a, a use case that most people can uh, understand and, and uh, get their heads around the, the value of remote monitoring. It's, it's monitoring, and here it's really making sure that you've got a good source of power supply and avoiding any unplanned downtime or interruption in, in power um, in uh, any of the applications. And you know, talk to a big commercial production facility um, or a mine site, you know, if, if you lose power in the prime application, then the whole mine site and the production facility where they're processing ore goes down. They're really looking at total cost of ownership um, as well as safety, and there is an element of compliance uh, uh, that grows in terms of uh, more the critical of the asset or the application, 
that it's supporting, then you start getting to a lot of need to standardize work and quality of, of support. So users in this case are looking at their different operating uh, key performance indicators. It might be health related, but it might also be production. It also might be uh, some of the power and the load and as well as the, the type of energy. We get into applications where you're mixing with solar as an example. They might start looking at percentage of renewable um, as, a, as a source of power. The last segment is, is rental, and we see um, a lot of the power that goes into the power rental applications, so power that are for um, big events like sporting events, um, concerts, that is uh, renting power into those applications. Is, it needs to run. It is When it's on site, it is uh, somewhat of a, a prime or continuous power uh, operation. And here users are really looking at return on asset. It, when it's running, it better run. Um, that's devastating in terms of any income or revenue for the, the rental company. Um, they, it's really a cash flow issue. Uh, the users can see the generator status, the location, fuel level, and then manage the profitability, uh, looking at you know optimizing the rental rates as well as the roll-in, roll-out uh, in the fleet. Terry, this is interesting. It, it seems like the manufacturer of every major piece of equipment in our building is offering some remote monitoring system. What's different about those services? Well, the, um, yes, as, as we've gotten the, the deployment of the technology and connecting products, remote monitoring, it's an increasing, actually electric power is probably one of the industries that's most advanced in terms of the remote monitoring. Um, the way to differentiate some of those services are the starting point is can the, the service offer it across the multiple brands? Um, and then can they connect if you're, if you're a customer who's got multiple types of gen sets, even multiple generations of controllers, and we'll get into that in the, in the next slide, need to be able to understand and ascertain their capability to connect those. Um, the second thing was is, you know, the frequency of the data. Um, what is the the intake of the data from the assets? Um, we can see um, from capabilities anywhere from once an hour down to in in Caterpillar we offer down to one hertz, so once a second data. The other th one is just the quantity of the data. Um, so there's you know the the scope of the applications, the quantity of the data, and the frequency of data are kind of the things that you can look at in terms of differentiating from, purely from a technical perspective. So as, I, as I, I alluded to a bit before, Mike, was that that was a, you know, a good question. It was to also look at, um, we get the questions a lot about, can I, um, how hard is it to get connected? And the answer is, is in the industrial space, unlike um, construction equipment, which Caterpillar's got a lot of it, you know, connected assets there. There is no there there is no standard across electric power applications in terms of the way people are structuring the electronic controls and therefore the software and the way they send data. So it's when you get into a remote monitoring agreement and you start talking to somebody about what they're going to be able to pull for data, you really need to dig into the the details a bit here and make sure that you're able to pull the data that's going to solve your problem or, you know, feed the information to be able to track for your key performance indicators to drive actual insight. If you don't have good data, then it doesn't, it doesn't matter. So the first thing is you've got to look at what is the data that's stored in the GenSet controller um, that, that's critical information. Um, what we need to do then is to create what we call a configuration file, which translates that data or whatever, however the controller manufacturer software provider has written that software into a language that can be read by the remote monitoring application. So think of this step two as, as a translator. So your, your GenSet controller is, is speaking Spanish and your, your remote application is speaking French this this box here, number two, is, is basically translating that from Spanish to French. 
that sends the data into the telematics device, which it's either typically we see most often cellular or Ethernet. And that sends the decoded parameters and faults to the remote monitoring application in a language that it can read. And then the application users can gain actionable insights from this data. Uh, a real key point on this is, you know, quality data. The application will read whatever is available. Uh, the key point is uh, translating it. As we do this, though, understanding that as you get connected into the assets in the field, we provide what we call a site assessment to actually take an inventory of the controls in there um, so that you look at what kind of data is available from the controls. Um, here we've got some examples between CAN, which is J1939, which follows fairly standard if, if the controller uh, software uh, developer has followed the standard, that can be pretty standard across the different controllers. When we get into Modbus, um, which is one of the most common uh, protocols that we see, there aren't any standards, so what we usually end up having to do, you'll have to ask the, the provider of your controllers is to get a list of their Modbus registers. That is non-standard. When we get those, that's where we get the custom config creation file that translates, that pulls the data sets and decodes and translate that data. Then the next step is you got to make sure that you can you can test the data, that the, the logic is there. So if you say, you know, fuel burn, I take a really example, easy example conceptually and explain how complex it can be. Say fuel consumption, average fuel consumption. Um, as we look at it, Sometimes the fuel consumption off of the, the controller can be defined as in one working day. It can be instantaneous or it can be over several days. And as you can understand that, you know, depending on what your, your denominator is in the calculation, that can give you a different fuel consumption output. So what we do is we test that data and make sure that it matches what the assumption is on the application. And then the last one is if in the case that the output from the controller is different, we sometimes have to update the application so that the calculations match what the user is interpreting into the user interface or mobile application. So it's it's important that if you're looking at this that you're um, understanding what you're you're getting. Sometimes some of the remote monitoring services will provide a tool um, that can be leveraged to create those configuration files. Sometimes they provide a service in, in the in the back office, and sometimes you've got just the inventory of the configuration files uh, available. Um, download as part of the application. It somewhat depends on how long it's been out in the industry. Hey, Terry, I've got a couple questions on this topic. <clears throat> you say major customers are using this system. Yet yeah, we would be reluctant to use a system like this for data security reasons. What should people look for if they have questions about remote monitoring systems? That's a that's a question that we get a lot as well. Um, I'm going to get into that in terms of the security slides and, and data management um, as we you know start looking at how we protect the, the data and and pro and provide security around it. Um, that is a critical element for evaluating your, your services. So let's say we have a mixed fleet of CAT and another supplier's gen sets. Can you also monitor the other supplier's gen sets? Oops, sorry. Um, yes, that's that's a common request. Um, there's Even if it's a different vendor for the gen sets, oftentimes they have different controllers. So what what we do is we do work with the customer again going through that site assessment and we create the configuration files to to monitor those sometimes if it's a uh an, an oem or a vendor you can look at it and they will support a certain generation of controllers only or they will support only their own gen sets so since we have to support customers with a fleet um, not always unfortunately with caterpillar gen sets we do provide that as a service 
Okay, we got some good questions. Um, so I'm going to go through a use case in terms of remote monitoring, um, kind of a, a, a workflow of what we see. There's um, one of the other aspects of the data that's information, and this will become apparent when I get into the differences between remote monitoring and SCADA, is pulling in some of this other information. Um, almost all power applications ask for a technician or somebody in the powerhouse to conduct asset inspections. Most of the time here we're showing it all digital in terms of a mobile device. Most of the times what we see is this is somebody with an Excel spreadsheet or a clipboard um, filling in the information. Maybe they're doing it daily, maybe they're doing it hourly, but they're out there pulling in information, critical information on the gen set or the switch gear um, and, and uploading that and then tracking that information over time. This is capturing some of the broader machinery data, so it's not just the, the the load, but also, you know, is there something leaking? What's the what do the terminals look like on the battery? Are they corroded? That kind of information. The other thing was uh, I talked about the machinery data, so we're pulling in in step one the site data, important site data. The next one is the remote uh, monitoring machinery data, merging those together to proactively identify any issues that would prevent the start of the gen set or cause a downtime of the application. Um, with that, we can remote troubleshoot and diagnose, uh, get into the machinery or the, the OEM's uh, maintenance and uh, inspection and uh, product support information. From there, you start planning the field work. Um, this can be done Again, remotely, uh, looking at the application, merging into the maintenance uh, schedules, and, and planning out the maintenance. And this is where there's a collaboration if it's a customer um, outsourcing the maintenance to another service provider, they can collaborate through the application and uh, as they start scheduling when the maintenance makes sense. And then completing the maintenance and repairs and validating that the repairs have been done. That can also be done through the application. And then once complete, once the gen set starts running again, if there were any alarms or alerts, you can see that through the maintenance schedule that they've been updated and the alerts have been alarms have been cleared. All right, Terry, we actually have a series of questions related to the workflow. And let me start by asking, what is the minimum duration of a monitoring contract? Um, I, you can there there are opportunities for monthly. What we see typically in, in the across the industry is uh, the usually the minimum level agreement is about a year, and then we see them going up to um, five years, ten years, and there are some agreements if a big capital investment uh, up to twenty years for remote monitoring. How long does it take to install and then activate the monitoring system on our gen set? For um, the gen sets out of the, the factory, um, connecting just to the gen set controller, um, it's anywhere between an hour to two hours in terms of the installation. Um, there is um, set up in terms of the uh, login and usability, but you know you're you're looking at less than uh, four hours, somewhere to two to four hours all in. If you're getting into retrofitting into older control systems, um, different control systems. Uh, expanding it to the switch gears and energy storage, um, we ask we provide a, a technical documentation called a site assessment, and those can go anywhere from eight hours to you know sometimes two or three days. Again, it depends on the complexity of the control systems that we're connecting into. I think this next question is something that's in the back of everybody's minds these days. What happens when the technology changes? Is the hardware then going to become obsolete? Um, yeah, and I guess the, the starting point, and increasingly I think there's um, uh, a view to manage the obsolescence of technology, starting with the control systems. Um, controls, we've got controls that have been out there for or gen sets have been out there for 30, 40 years. When you think even of a standby gen set, that the gen set might not be running, but you got to think that your controller's on all the time. Is you know, 
really do you, should you be doing some controls upgrades? Um, so I would say that, you know, controllers, you should be thinking that also from a data perspective, as you start getting more robust and, and uh, modern electronics, you're going to be able to get a richer data set. So you should probably be thinking in, you know, five to ten years, I'll just start thinking about controls upgrades, maybe ten for sure. Depends on the, the criticality of the asset. If we look at the telematics device that's providing the information, if it's a cellular device, um, just like your cell phone, shouldn't be any surprise to anybody. You should be thinking from an obsolescence perspective every three to five years. You should be changing that. And then from the, the software perspective, if you <clears> – <throat> that should be um, – software can go obsolete. There's a lot of security that's wrapped into it, and that's a, a faster technology life cycle. You should think about, you know, at least working with the, the vendor from a remote monitoring and understanding what they're going to do from maintenance and upgrade on, on the software as well. So really look through the whole end to end and, and ask the, your provider to what's their life cycle planning. So if we have emergency generators with remote monitoring installed around the world, can we get a dashboard with all the gen sets in different locations all in one view? Um, yes, that's, that's a great question. And that's actually one of the big benefits of remote monitoring is that you can, you know, synthesize the data across multiple sites, multiple geographic areas into one user interface and synthesize and start comparing sites and comparing assets to each other. Let me throw one other question at you. What's the maximum number of generators I can connect or aggregate into one group? Um, from depending on the, the technology, the way the, the remote monitoring application has been set up, it's it it can vary. Um, from a Caterpillar perspective, we've got some very large customers, and we're basically unlimited um, in terms of the number of generators that we can monitor. We haven't hit a limit yet. Very good, very good question. Okay, this is a good opportunity for uh, Terry to get a drink and uh, catch your breath. And let's turn to our latest poll question. And that is, what are some of the assets that you might want to monitor, uh, monitor remotely? Generator, switch gear, energy storage, or other? So take a second, think about it, and... Uh, Go ahead and put down which assets that you would like to monitor remotely, generator, switch gear, energy storage, or other. And then we'll go ahead and take a look at what our poll results are on that. And overwhelmingly, with nearly three-quarters of those of you checking in, generator is the thing that you want to monitor remotely, followed by switch gear, and then energy shortage, and only about... 3% of you want other. All right, Terry, we're going to give it back to you. All right. Thank you. Um, that's interesting. <clears throat> so next we're going to get into the remote monitoring versus SCADA and um, try to synthesize this down into a visual that would be helpful for everybody. Um, SCADA systems um, are the supervisory control system for in, in, in a powerhouse um, and monitoring the different gen sets and controls. Um, we get the question, if I've got a SCADA system and I've got the alarms and alerts and I can do some trending, why would I want to do remote monitoring? Um, and the answer is typically is the, your SCADA system is inside your, your firewall. There's limited ability to extract the data um, beyond the firewall of the, of the company. So if you that previous question to if I wanted to look at comparing, you know, gen sets across multiple sites across the globe, um, you're very limited. Um, typically, also SCADA systems in terms of the data that they're pulling, they might have the ability to trend some of that data. Um, it's usually a limited amount of, of data that it, you can trend. Um, typically, what we see is around maybe 30 days of data, and it's it's really more around uh, alarms and alerts to uh, the limits that are set at, with the control system. When we get into remote monitoring, we, we actually uh, pull that data 
from the SCADA. We stay off the process control network from a security perspective. We're just pulling some of the data so there's see those little, uh, they're supposed to be um, little uh, locks there between the, the SCADA and, and to the remote monitoring. So we set up the firewall and, and the, the security keys and we pull that, that data back to the machinery data in the, the storage. But what remote monitoring allows us to do is to take that machinery data and incorporate other business data. So I talked about earlier about those um, inspection data. You know, that's that we're finding that very, very interesting amount of data to combine with the machinery data to understand problems. We also compare uh, pull-in data for, especially in prime applications, the oil sample data to give us some of the, um, you know, trend line on some of the oil and contaminants, we got fluid property sensors, that kind of other information and, and data in there. So we merge that and build analytic models around it and expose that into the remote monitoring, what in Caterpillar's applications called remote asset monitoring or RAM, into the into the web-based application or mobile for the, the business users um, to, to drive actionable insight. Um, one of the things we had an interesting use case not too long ago, and this is a, a key difference between remote monitoring and SCADA, was we alerted a customer to uh, the need for them to change their air filter, and they, they said, well, there, there's no issue. Um, but we were trending and predicting that when, the, you know, there's an air filter blockage happening before the alarm went off on the SCADA system. So I gave them, especially in a remote location, more time to plan. The other thing is we provide, you know, remote monitoring once you get that data off and outside, you can also provide that securely into other business systems, um, business networks. A lot of customers are looking at um, like uh, rental fleets. They want to pull in some of the basic data into their systems in terms of billing and invoicing. Um, the other thing is we see a lot of it in terms of um, accounting systems, in terms of providing that, that data into those accounting systems. So they can synthesize that. So that's that's really a, a big difference between it and the benefit of being able to combine the machinery data with some of this other business data. This is where in, in the industry we start looking at um, what they're calling uh, digital transformation. So changing your business processes around the, the digital information. Okay. So if I, I summarize again, these I guess this is a uh, trying to drive some, give you guys some value out of this. It, it summarize the differences between um, where remote monitoring can add value that you can't get with SCADA. First one is that that first top left bullet point is that you have greater visibility and you can optimize the use. So this cross-site asset data and business data. Um, the second one is asset managers can see additional alerts in detail and context. Um, so that you can understand the broader uh, influence on asset performance. Um, the third one was you can prevent these issues by being able to pull in the data and trend line it. Uh, you can do some more predictive analytics and recommendation on the action items. Um, the last one, there's no added IT infrastructure cost when you're Using a, somebody's remote monitoring service, um, users, you can pull in this data and not have to set up an expensive IT network or a bunch of servers um, and not put a burden on your also your existing system. But go up on the top right um, uh, bullet point. One thing that I didn't go through in that visual early on was that SCADA systems, I did mention that SCADA systems usually keep data for what we see typically, maybe 30 days. For remote monitoring applications, they because of the analytics, you keep data for a lot longer trending perspective to help build the analytics. In the application, we provide standard 13 months of data. So if a customer wants to look across the sites or their assets, they can do some trending across the different assets for the last 12 months. We find that's important for business-related data and business decision-making. We do archive the data for 10 years for the customers. Uh, that allows them that from a compliance perspective as well, that it, it provides them the opportunity to provide those reports in case of 
an audit, whether it's an internal or an external audit. Um, that goes into that asset managers for the audits, um, store and run the reports, and assets per, uh, meet performance standards. One of the interesting things that uh, we see is um, system integration companies who are designing in the power for a facility. Um, when when you do the installation, you run the gen set, make sure that it's performing based on the engineering specs. What we're doing is working with them and, and uh, getting them connected at that point and, co and automating the collection of the data and the information so that their report is automated. And then we archive that data so if they want to come back and retrieve it in case of any discussions in the future about, you know, the engineering around it. So it's, it's a great way to document it and you truly got um, uh, critical information and it, it's not um, perception or maybe emotion in some cases. The third bullet point is the you know, get the asset managers get decision making support. Um, here we're you know you're with remote monitoring you can allow users who are experts to help provide support. So if there's I think across industry um, seeing some numbers we've got a significant amount of people in industrial applications that will be retiring in the next five years, and there's a shortage of those deep domain expertise um, in in powerhouses. So what we can do with remote monitoring is, is take advantage of the, the fewer number of them and allow them to log in and monitor and support uh, wherever they happen to be. Um, and as well as, you know, with that, leveraging their expertise to train some of the newer, less experienced uh, people. Um, and the last one was, you know, your asset managers, you can connect to your dealer or service provider. So one thing from a facility to your maintenance provider, um, you can actually start collaborating through the, the user interface or the web application to schedule maintenance, to schedule site visits, delivery of materials, and you don't have to necessarily track each other down through telephone calls and, uh, and emails. So those are really the, the, to summarize and maybe not oversimplify the benefits of remote monitoring versus you know, simple SCADA system on its own. <clears throat> okay. So we're getting into the uh, uh, data privacy and, and security um, aspect. Um, is um, we, if you boil down, everybody gets into an application. Um, typically, you'll be given um, an end user license agreement. Um, they're complicated, they're written by attorneys. Um, not everybody reads them. For Caterpillar, what we've done is we've boiled them down into four simple bullet points. They're out on their public documentation. It's called our Connected Product Data Principles. Um, we are transparent about the data. Um, customers opt in. We don't collect the data without approval from the customers. We protect it. Um, we wrap it around the security to, to and change that technology to make sure that we're secure. We respect the data rights of others. So if we would happen to share the data with a, a supplier who's working on a product issue with us, we make sure that the vendor, that supplier, protects the data um, just like we, we do ourselves. We make that commitment. We cascade that out to the supply chain. And we are basically the, the goal of our use of our data is to create value for our, our customers improving our, our products. So I think it's it's important to go through what's the what's the data collection process, the procedure of sharing the data, and what's the intent around it. Hey Terry, before you go on uh, on data rights, let me ask you this: Can I give access to others in our company to see our generator? And if so, how many people can have that access? Um, yes. Yeah, so what we do is we work with the customers, and in most applications. Um, we, the, well, not most, all the applications, the customer decides who across their business has access to the data. They also can define what kind of rights that they have around that data. So as an example, in some of the standby said, we'll do remote start stop. Obviously, you don't want everybody in your company to have that remote start stop capability. So it is a personalized ID and a capability set that we, we allow. So, and it is unlimited, but it is specific by person. 
Okay, so going through, so we, that was the, the way we do data, you know, collection and protection, getting to the security principles um, for the products. Um, our commitment is to strengthen our cybersecurity and is really as a competitive advantage, um, uh, protect and prioritize the security risk by our assets. Um, we have a very formal process of design for security. We also do monitor for any um, detection of a security issue. Um, and just like most customers have got a, a security, you know, and uh, security response, we also have a, our safety response. We have a security response where we go through some drills about what happens and, and make sure um, that we're rapid, we're able to rapidly respond to it. And then we have a formal education process across actually the whole entire enterprise in terms of the importance of, of data security. The reason why we do this, and I think increasingly across the industry, at least I hope so, is to create the, the trust. And it's, and it's essential for the customers to trust whoever you've got for a remote monitoring service. Um, so the starting point is, you know, to have people consider us is we are um, – uh, explicit and open about what we uh, intend to do with our digital values and security principles. Uh, our goal is for a customer to make the purchase um, and that it's the right product or, or service. We're very explicit about how we use uh, data and the security support. Um, after a customer buys it, they integrate it into their workflow and their processes. And so we need to make sure that we're keeping up to date and, and maintaining high level security of offerings uh, and responsive support. And as we maintain the, this, um, we want to maintain the support and continuous excellent support. So this ongoing, this I talked about, you know, security and data management tools is probably one of the fastest paced technologies. So at Caterpillar, we're really looking at that in every vendor. When you go to ask them, you should be asking them what they're doing in terms of their, their strategies. And then the last one is the goal is that we hope that people advocate um, for the brand. And this becomes a brand differentiator, as it should be, um, in, this, in this space. <clears throat> so I'm going to end a little bit on the, the fun part of it was, you know, what do we see the distributed energy of the future? Um, this is a, a, a view of a, a SCADA system. Um, I believe this is actually a cheese factory. Um, and this is, you know, very two-dimensional. It started in the 80s um, with the human machine interface at the site. It's two-dimensional visual, visuals. You've got alarms, alerts, and then you've got a system overview of what's going on. Um, if anybody played Pac-Man um, in, the, in the 80s, this is somewhat like the first generation of the video game of, of Pac-Man. As we get into it, so, as, you know, now we're here at connecting people with products remotely, um, remotely viewing through a web interface with the product and interacting with them. But as we go forward, there's a significant amount of growing uh, data and looking at augmented reality and virtual reality um, to, to process the data and help contextualize it for people. It's a lot, pe it's a lot easier for people to see it in the three dimension they're used to seeing it on the asset than it is in terms of just looking at it, you know, uh, on a squiggly lines as sometimes our fleet advisors call it. So we see up here on the top, we see, you know, a, a track type tractor. We've got gen sets um, that are three dimensional. So actually from a remote troubleshooting, we have, you know, this is called a digital twin. This is sitting on a desk of an, of an engineer or um, a remote maintenance company but they're actually looking at a three-dimensional view of, of the genset um, at their desktop and overlaying the machinery data as comparing it with what we call the augmented reality where your technician standing in front of the genset um, looking at the physical product but then looking through a tablet or, or a, you know, a visual uh, like a Google HoloLens or whatever. Um, at the asset and overlying the machinery data. So they can really start collaborating and really, you know, talking through and helping each other in terms of what this is, and then just helping people contextualize what the problem is. 
you know, we're really seeing a, a strong adoption in the power plant, the virtual power plant of the future, where you've actually got a, you know, uh, people sitting there remotely looking at and walking through and and talking through, you know, maintenance and support and operation of the power plant in the service and the operations. So it really reduces the the travel and training costs. And as I talked about earlier, I, I would one of the questions we should probably ask sometime in the poll questions is how many of you are having challenges in terms of getting, you know, qualified uh, service and, and technical staff? And I would see we see it overwhelmingly. It's it's a huge issue for the industry. Yeah, it is an issue, Terry. And what would you consider though these tools of AR and VR? Would this help attract talent to the business, especially when you you consider kids who've grown up with video games? Um. That's a that's an excellent question, and I, I guess I would say um, I've got two sons who played a lot of video games. It's, it's almost an expectation of, of kids now is that uh, it's you know, this augmented reality, virtual reality is, is part of what they're expecting as part of the job set. So I would say definitely it is an opportunity to hire new talent. It's also a, a way to leverage your existing talent and remotely, even you know, as they get into short short. Uh, numbers in the high demand form. So. All right, Terry, great presentation. We want to get to the questions, but before we do that, let me tell you that we'll have additional resources, including a recording of today's webinar, available for you on the landing page. Now, throughout the presentation today, we have had several questions come in, and we want to take a couple of minutes to uh, take on as many of those as possible. Terry, the first one is, in our case, we need control and manage 600 moto generator multi-vendor, and in some case, old equipment. Is it possible to implement a solution for this particular case? The, the short answer is yes. Um, I go back to that, uh, the point I was bringing up before, is the starting point would be a, to go through and do a site assessment of what you've got, right, what generation of controllers, uh, what kind of data is available from those controllers. Um, we've got gensets in one of our facilities that were installed in 1976. So as you can imagine, there's not a lot of electronic data. So you really need to start there and then look at what it's going to take to be able to collect the data, whether it's whether you might want to do some upgrade in those controls. But yes, it, it, is, it is doable. There will be some engineering you know, that needs to be done if if you've got a lot of different generations, a lot of different controllers. I have a question regarding security, and that is because of the external connection, aren't we introducing security risk for critical applications? So what we do is we sit down with customers. Um, you know, having a connection, this is one thing I've learned from the security folks is, you know, Putting a firewall around a, a building and an asset doesn't necessarily make it more secure. In fact, most security violations happen with your own employees. Um, so I would say it's not any less secure. We do spend a lot of time with customers to set up firewall rules. Um, there is always a risk, right? I think one of the benefits maybe is we're also monitoring our own application for any security vulnerabilities. So um, we can actually know if there's our attack vendors, but um, uh, we we take it very seriously. We can usually work through those with, with a customer. Okay, here's another question. Can CAT Connect be used with all CAT Genset control panels, including other rebranded controls like the Deep Sea? That's a, that's. Yes, in fact, we are working on deep sea. We are um, increasingly, we're creating a, a, when I talked earlier about those config files, configuration files, um, we're creating an inventory of configuration files. And our commitment is, you know, to be able to connect with whatever. I just want to be clear with everybody is it's not, that because there are no standards, um, it does take a little bit of engineering each time to create those configuration files. Okay, we still have a few minutes now to uh, take on a couple other questions. The latest one is, what is the cost per gen set to install a remote monitor? 
from a, a hardware or engineering perspective? Just I don't know if that was clear, but I'll yeah, I'll it, it, it it's not clear in there, but I guess I address it from a hardware perspective. So from a hardware perspective, um, you're looking at probably between, I would say, you know, seven hundred to fifteen hundred dollars round numbers from a hardware, just a gen set, um, and then going back to the you know the configuration file that might take you know a few days of, of engineering work. Um, and then uh, after that, then it's, you know, the subscriptions. The, the most common commercial model is the subscription, so it's, it's a monthly charge. And that, that varies across all vendors in the, in the industry, um, somewhere between, you know, 10 to $100, $150. Again, it, it depends on the amount of data and the frequency of data per month. Okay, the next question is, can we also remove the faults through remote monitoring? That's a um, you can you can remove the the faults, but if the faults are not existing on the controller, they're just going to come back. Right? If if you got a fault, there's a reason for it. So it that typically. Um, you can clear them, but if the controls have still got a fault, they're going to come back. So you, that's where you still need to get somebody on site to resolve them. The benefit of having remote monitoring is you can decide what level of the, the criticality of the fault is. If it's not critical and it's in the middle of the night on the Saturday night, you could probably you can wait till Monday, right? At least you know about it. Terry, since it's cellular data link, how much data does it require per month, i.e., one gigabyte. Oh golly, um, that's a that's a good question. It again, it varies. We go anywhere from um, I think the lowest is fourteen data channels to one of the sites we've got twelve thousand channels. So as you can imagine, it it gets to be I think it'd be quite a bit. We do do some compression for the data um, to really optimize it. Um, I think some of the big power plants, we might be at, um, so how about if I just respond, I don't want to pull a number out and be completely wrong, make sure that I'll send that back in the written responses to the questions. Okay, sounds good. Uh, let me give you at least one more. Our integrator asks us to conduct daily site inspections, which are extremely costly as we are not on the same host site. Do you have any solutions such as cameras or additional sensors to reduce the frequency of these? That's a that's an awesome question. We're working with um, a customer now. Yeah, it depends on what they want to inspect. We're we're working with a customer now on some of the compliance. Um, where, uh, as an example, to understand because of the environment, to be able to detect any loss of fuel or leakage of fuel um, and it's a CHP cooling heating and power application glycol for the heating so we're installing some sensors um, to in flow meters on site to be able to avoid having somebody to go physically uh, there we are exploring um, not yet there commercially but we are exploring some of the, the cameras um, and some thermal imaging. All right. Our thanks to everyone who submitted questions. I think we had a good back and forth here in the last 10 minutes. Unfortunately, we have run out of time. As Terry mentioned in the uh, next to last question, we will respond to the questions that we didn't get here and also answer uh, some of the things that will require a little bit additional work. So. The questions and answers along with what we covered today, including a recording, will be posted on the landing page in the near future, so please check back. Again, CEUs will be issued by Bradley University to U.S.-based engineers that have requested them. And we're scoping out our next quarterly webinar, and we'll provide further details soon about that one. Many thanks again to Terry Lewis for her time and expertise. And above all, we appreciate everybody's questions and taking your time uh, to listen to today's webinar. 
For Caterpillar Electric Power, I'm Mike Dimmick. Thank you for joining us, and have a great day.